army is apparently nowhere near winning the war against the gunman. This coming week is the peak of the marching season, traditionally the most sensitive in Northern Ireland. The authorities were desperately anxious to keep the temperature right down. Belfast in flames. The troubles begin in earnest as riots, bombs and killing sweep across Northern Ireland. The British Army unable to help the Northern Irish government restore order. This is where the Hooded Men's story starts. It is with understandable reluctance that one uses these exceptional powers. I have therefore decided after consultation with Her Majesty's government in the United Kingdom to exercise where necessary the powers of detention and internment. Five, six minutes um, out of that and onto um, a helicopter, pushed onto the helicopter and it was people handcuffed to me. And after a period of, I don't know, 10 minutes or whatever length of time it was, the door suddenly burst open and I was kicked out and bang, down onto the ground. And I squealed, I, I never even got a, a full squeal out of me um, because I hit the ground that fast. An apprentice car mechanic, Joe Clark, is the youngest of the hooded men. I was brought into a room where I was stripped naked and got uh, a so-called medical and a boiler suit was put on me and the hood was then put back on me. And when, when the hood was on me, on my hand here, there was the, the number four wrote on it. And from then on, I wasn't known as Joe or Clark or whatever, it was number four. And that was how they addressed me for the, the next seven days. Although they don't know it at the time, the men have been flown to an airbase at Ballykelly, 65 miles from Belfast. There, a secret interrogation centre has been specially constructed by the Joint Intelligence Wing of the British Army, who are overseeing the operation. The interrogators themselves are a group of RUC Special Branch officers selected for the task. spread against the wall. And you had a storm with your fingertips to the wall, right? And uh, and if you didn't, you were badly beaten. And you had a storm back from the wall. They got to the position, you'd have been a nerve, you know what I'm saying? See that position there? Your fingertips, and you were back like that there. After 15, 20 minutes or so, my hands and my arms got tired and numb from being in the one position. So I remember taking one hand down to shake my arm to, to get the pins and needles out of it, but I didn't get my arm down the whole way. I only got it off the wall and I was unmercifully beaten. Two guys, one on either side of me, with battens. And I was left in a heap in the corner on the ground and they just continued to batter and batter at me and I was squealing like a pig. The whole seven days that we were there, they didn't, they didn't uh, uh, ease up on me. And at one stage, I actually flipped and uh, chased around the room until I got myself a, a soldier or policeman, whatever it was, and started thumping him. Uh, they then sent six or seven, whatever it was, people in. They handcuffed my hands together, handcuffed my feet together, and then they 
put the handcuffs from my feet up my back to my hands, uh, put me up in the air and dropped me down. I, I think I must have been went unconscious and I woke up again in this room. room and it was lights twice as powerful as that and you couldn't see nothing the hood was taken up the hair your hands was put behind your back like so and you were they were pushed up right there was an arm around the here and your head was pulled up the hood was pulled up the hair and all these questions were being fired at you it was like something from a second world war film right that uh where's the guns who in the ARA with all this crap, right? And you couldn't answer the meeting anyway. The way you were fucking strangled, you couldn't even answer this. Who do you know in the IRA? I don't know anybody in the IRA. And the hood went down and you get battered and you get taken off uh, uh, out of the room and battered um, the, along the corridor with the third one whacking you with a, um, uh, a baton and put back onto the, onto the wall. And then I started telling them um, school friends, people that I'd been at school with and hadn't seen in four or five years. I would have told them anybody's name, but I didn't know anybody in the IRA. The IRA leadership appeared untouched. Republicans were quick to deride the poor intelligence behind internment. A member of of the Republican movement. <coughs> Obviously, the battle of the British Army hasn't been won. The losses of the, in the IRA have been very slight, even in internment. You mean that they haven't even got near the, the, the leaders at all? They haven't, no. We had prayer warning of this roundup. But consequently, we took the necessary precautions that there was nobody sleeping in their own homes or anything like that. What's going to happen to you now? I honestly believed that the British government could not allow me out of this situation alive. I honestly believed that it was impossible for them to survive the public humiliation for them to have done what they did on me. Teacher Paddy Joe McLean from County Tyrone was a founding member of the Civil Rights Association. He had no connections with the IRA. We never thought that civilization, you know, would allow that sort of brutalization of people. We thought we'd passed that centuries ago. When he got out and he was in the hospital wing, he managed to get a letter or a message smuggled out. It was a dangerous thing to do, and the person who took the message out for him was putting his own life at risk, and Dad's life was at risk also. But this person, who remains nameless, Dad has never, ever told any of us his name, uh, he got the message to this priest, um, who then went to Cardinal Conway who was the, the, the Catholic primate at that time. And he went straight on a, over to England. And I think he went and spoke to Ted Heath at that time, and that then got the torture stopped. After nine days, the rest of the hooded men's immediate ordeal was finally over. They were sent back initially to the Crumlin Road Jail, where they joined the hundreds of other internees locked up without trial. 
news began to filter out of the prison. I think in justification for these methods, um, it has to be remembered that there was a desperate need to get intelligence um, and that it was thought, rightly so, that lives depended on getting intelligence. And if by using techniques, which um, I think most people felt fell short of torture as normally defined, if these methods um, would give intelligence which uh, would save lives, then arguably there was a case for, for using them. A number of those who were taken, and not by any means the most junior in the ranks of the IRA, uh, were described by those who were carrying out interrogation as singing like canaries. Um, I, would, I think we're talking around something like a dozen or more people. So in that sense, a lot of very good information, though, of course, relatively short term in value, was, was obtained. <laughs> That's total bullshit. If you look at the the facts and the paperwork, it's sure. What intelligence did they get? What, what, right? Like, what did they get? There was 350 men in turn. There was more things happened after a term than ever happened before or during it. Right. The authorities in Dublin had come to the view that what happened constituted torture. We put that to the British government. It was denied. We felt the only course of action then open to us, if we couldn't achieve anything bilaterally, we would bring a case to the European Commission and Court of Human Rights. The British had quietly settled the civil case in the UK without admitting liability. When the case went public in Europe, they were reluctant to admit any systematic wrongdoing. The British government is prepared to admit that some detainees have been ill-treated, but they claim that these were just regrettable lapses and that there was no, in the official phrase, administrative practice to torture detainees. The initial report of the European Commission in 1976 ruled that the use of the five techniques did in fact amount to inhuman treatment and torture. But then, two years later, in the European Court of Human Rights, the British were cleared of torture, the treatment downgraded to the lesser inhuman and degrading. For the hooded men, the finding that their treatment couldn't be called torture came as a hammer blow. If you ask them, they would know it was inhumane. Inhumane is when you kick a dog or a cat, isn't it? But, you know, it, uh, it was far worse than that. And it just made, it, made light of it and made light of, like, we've paid the man off. He really wasn't that bad. He's still alive, you know, but they weren't living with him. 
he didn't sleep very well at all. He shouted in his sleep, he even shouted in the bath. You know, when he'd come in from work and he'd be lying in the bath, I would hear him shouting, you bastards, you bastards, why are you doing this? What form did this so-called torture take? It was the brain. I thought I was going mad on occasions. For one time, I tried to catch a rough part in the wall, the skin or something in the wall, to tear my nails out. Why? Because the noise was driving me crazy and the thirst was driving me crazy. And I just wanted to die quick. I tried so hard to make life as normal as possible. I don't know if that was the right thing or not, but I wanted him to be happy. And I think he never felt totally at ease for forever. And then he took cancer. He died from cancer, as you know. Uh, he never came to terms with, uh, with, with the questioning and the treatment that he received. Macken was starting out as a human rights lawyer at the time. So in late 2013, I was uh, brought to a meeting and asked to advise on the possibility of reopening the case. Now, at, at that stage, um, the dogs in the street knew about the Ireland v. the UK ruling. It's a, it's a ruling that you learn from first year in law school. So whilst we are well aware of the, of the ruling and the significance of the ruling, it was a bit unclear at that stage as to how the ruling could be attacked. Uh, in terms of legally uh, and evidentially. A good place to begin was the treasure trove of secret British government documents held in the National Archive. They discovered these papers, and they were top secret papers, and, and they actually read uh, for the government eyes only. We saw the papers, they go, we didn't write them, <laughs> right? We worked out that um, it was Bally Kelly where the torture itself had occurred. Now, that was a fact that was never told to the European court in, in the first instance, and it actually was a, a fact that was clouded in, in many instances in the judgment. It was a purpose-built torture facility. It was a facility that had one purpose and one purpose only, and it was to see the uh, deploying of the five techniques on these men. Evidence of a British government cover-up began to emerge. Information had been withheld from the court hearings, including audio tapes of the interrogations that subsequently disappeared. A documentary by the Irish state broadcaster RTE in 2014 made further revelations. One secret government memo highlighted in the film, written by a subsequent Home Secretary, was explosive. It described the hooded men's treatment as torture and confirmed the role played by Prime Minister Ted Heath's defence secretary. He specifically names Lord Carrington as the individual who oversaw the techniques being deployed. He makes it expressly clear that Lord Carrington was instrumental in the techniques being deployed. Responsibility ultimately would lie, presumably, with the Prime Minister Ted Heath. Well, the responsibility goes right to the top, including the, the then Prime Minister, Ted Heath. not only for myself, but particularly for the families of those who died. At least I've had lived to see my grandchildren. I have great-grandchildren. I've seen my, my children grow up and a young man and a young woman. And, uh, and um, I've been blessed that I had all that. 
the, the children of those who died didn't have their fathers. Yes, I would want an apology. And uh, the, the, the result in the Supreme Court has been unbelievable. There's four or five, five of the hooded men that never seen that. I've seen it, and I'm happy enough. For the families of the hooded men who have since died, the legal recognition is too little, too late. If the British government turned around now and say sorry, would it, would it make, change anything? Not for Pat. For you? I always knew, I always knew the truth of it. I don't need words to tell me what actually happened to him and what he told me happened to him and what the other men have said. I think they ought to the families to recognise that this was wrong, that the British Army were wrong, that the police were wrong at that time.